when he was first arrested, I was nine. We were unaware of anything. I didn't know what was going on, but you see police, and so you panic. Of course, they questioned me about a homicide and a robbery that occurred, I think it was four or five months prior. And I was totally <laughs> knocked back. I was, I, I don't know anything about that. I was arrested 1030 that night. So for many years, um, myself, and my sisters never knew what my father was arrested for until we were old enough to fully understand what was going on. I remember going to the prison every week, every other week. So we saw him the whole time he was there. We began to question as we got older, myself and my sisters, when was he coming home? I had a lot of questions and I wanted to know how they did this to my dad. How did this happen? I never doubted that he was innocent because I, from what I, when I did find out what I understood, I knew my dad was home, like he was always with us. There was never a time when family was never not together. So for me as a child, it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't put it together. No, I, I never had a doubt that he was innocent. Family support is everything when you're going through a trauma in your life because that's the only people that you can trust. So family support is essential. My trial lasted 18 months. When you're sentenced, you can pretty much go to certain prisons. So I chose to be at Greater Ford mm -hmm. for the benefit of my family, so my family could see me. We were privy to have access to all of his notes of testimony. He would say to me, if you read it, you will uncover what's going on in my case without me having to tell you. Every time I would go visit him, I would say, Dad, this don't make sense to me. And he would say, okay, but keep reading. <laughs> so he would challenge us to see if we saw what he saw. He had already figured out the flaws in his case before he even gave us a hint as to what was going on. At the time that they say that the crime occurred, he couldn't have been in two places at one time, but you had to play the timeline out. If they were trying to say that it was indeed him who committed the crime, then it would not have fit what was in his notes of testimony. After reading it several times, we, I saw that. From day one that I was incarcerated, I immediately started fighting for my freedom. It wasn't until 2006 when uh, a breakthrough came. I never forget, I, I would look up his case so often just to see where it was. And when it got to the panel of judges, I'm, I was very familiar with oh, everybody who would look at the case. Hmm. Um, I never forget the day I read it and it said they were sending it back to the lower court. They were not denying it they were sending it back to the lower court. So I say, well, what does that mean? So mm -hmm. now I gotta run back to Graterford. <laughs> Dad, what does this mean? They're sending it back to the lower courts, you know, so on and so forth. Right. So, you know, he would always say to us, don't get excited, you know, we have to be calm and let's, you know, do this, do this, do this. Um, and that's how, that's how I remember us getting back into the court system. You don't think about going home after you reach 10, 15 years? Even though you fight for your freedom, my family was my strength. They are my champions. They kept me going. They kept me going. He would send home lists of names and send me a template of letters that he wanted me to send out to lawyers. I would send letters to 50, 60, 70 lawyers a month. No, I never gave up hope because my dad never allowed us to. So even when I thought the fight might be over, he always had hope. Once I knew my dad was innocent, it was my obligation for him to walk out of Graterford alive, mm. and that's what I fought for. What was that day like when you finally walked out those doors? Mm. It was surreal. It was like being reborn. It was amazing for me to have my dad back. I'm so grateful you know, and so appreciative.
and thankful to, you know, everybody who made it happen, you know, for him. I cannot thank the Innocence Project enough. This one here, I mean, whew, I cannot say enough about her. The youngest one, Shakima, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I call that my psychologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's always in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, Dad, how do you feel today? What's going on <laughs> with you, Dad? Well, you know, and this, that, and other. So between the two of them, I always say, God has blessed me with two gifts, two gracious gifts. It's invaluable. I couldn't have made it without them. I could not have made it without them. I was home when Dante was arrested, and the first thing I thought was something bad. I just thought it was going to be a couple hour ordeal and be over once I told him where I was or whatever. Went to the police station, um, tried to get information. They wouldn't tell me anything. So I went home and, you know, cried, you know, and waited for him to call. I wasn't involved in the shooting, and I was with a group of friends. I told him, I said, tell the police everything they need to know. You know, tell them where you were, tell them who you were with, tell them you want to take a polygraph test, tell them you didn't do it, tell them everything they need to know so that you can get home. What did the police do when you told them that? They didn't do nothing. And they charged me and the rest is pretty much history. I went to jail and got convicted and went to state prison. How old were you when you went to trial? And I was 21 when I went to trial. When he went to court, I was at trial every day. I was in that courtroom so much. I was there for every status hearing, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even there, the lawyers wasn't there, but I was there for every, every single time. I knew I had court coming. I would call home from jail and she would update me, let me know what was going on. How did it feel to, you know, know that your mom was staying on top of that for you? I felt good. It's a support. I, I needed her to do that because without it, I would have, I would still be in prison. When you knew that Dante was going to be going to state prison for essentially what could be the rest of, of his life, what me, what were you the most worried about? Him being so young and in jail and me not knowing, you know, because you know, you just see, but you know what you see on television, which a lot of times is probably not true, but you know, I watch Oz and I'm like, oh my God, my baby, you know? I'm like, he don't, he's 18, he don't need a meter, he don't know nothing, you know? But I just, just panic, panic, you know? You don't know what to think. Man, she crazy. Man, that wasn't crazy. You just don't know, you know, you don't know what, how to feel. You don't know what to think. And I'm just thinking, my, he's in there. He didn't do anything. He's a kid, you know? Of course, he's a man, you know? <laughs> and I still, he's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> how did you feel when we called to tell you that Dante was coming home? Mm -hmm. I was so excited. I was just so excited. Dante, how did it feel when you walked out, you know, from the courthouse and saw your mom standing there? I don't know, it felt crazy, like, I guess because I knew, I guess, I don't know, I guess in my head I knew I was going to be out of there one day, so I really couldn't show how I was feeling. I was really excited, though. I was really excited. I was expecting my mom to be crying, but I guess she cried the, uh, <laughs> the day before. Yeah, and you might have reacted a little different if he had known that they weren't going to file any more charges. And of course, I forgot to tell him. <laughs> so did yeah. 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 <laughs> So he just going along thinking he's just coming home on house arrest. And the news reporter actually told him. Ava, what did that moment feel like when Dante came out in his, you know, street clothes for the first time in 10 years and gave you a hug? Relief. Mm -hmm. I was just so relieved, you know. I think I fainted twice that day. For real? <laughs> <laughs> Getting out of prison was just, you know what I mean, knowing I should never been there was crazy. I was really excited, so I don't think Knowing I had charges dropped or whatever the case may be would have made a difference. Yeah. That's leaving was it. Uh, you know, I tell, yeah. tell her all the time how much I love her. And, you know, he's a writer. Even though I didn't write a lot, I would write my mom and tell her, send her cards and all that. So she know how much I appreciate her, how much I care for and love her and all that. I couldn't have done it without her. And we right. talked all the time. And we talked about pretty much everything, you know. Um, if, you, if it was something he couldn't, didn't want to say on the telephone, when I went, because I used, I went almost every week. We tight. Yeah, a little too tight sometimes, you know. I tell them sometimes, TMI. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Love you, Mom. I love you, too. Right, and see. I love you, people with the project. All right, thank I don't you, know. Nell. And right. everybody else here, thank you. All right, thank you all. We really appreciate it. Can't put a price on freedom and happiness.
1998, a jury found Gene Gilliard guilty of murder, a murder he did not commit and did not even see happen. I was actually a block and a half away when this crime actually occurred. Gene was convicted in January 1998 of murdering a business owner in Philadelphia. I actually heard the gunshots. A judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And actually, you know, observed perpetrators running from the scene. But he wasn't even at the crime scene. Uh, the best way I can describe it was I, complete, I was completely numb. You know, I was an individual who had faith in the justice system, never even thought that there's a possibility that I can be found guilty of a crime that I didn't commit. I just couldn't understand how they came back with a guilty verdict, because it's painful. You know, my only child, and I felt like a piece of me, even over the course of the times that he was gone, it was like I wasn't whole. Like a real important piece of me was missing because I felt like the justice system took a big part of my life away from me. Photo identification was the only evidence against Gene at the time. The victim's daughter identified a photo of him in 1997, two years after the shooting happened. Gene remembers the moments after police put him in handcuffs. It angered me that they were sitting here attempting to elude a confession from me and telling me to confess. And, you know, obviously this is something that I didn't do and I could not do. So you cannot confess to anything that you cannot do. He sat in a six by nine prison cell, innocent, for 15 years. But we correspond through letters and we didn't miss no phone calls. She always encouraged me to continue to fight for my own innocence. She just was my encouragement to continue to, you know, do everything that I possibly could to uh, gain the uh, the legal assistance that was necessary for me to ultimately prove my innocence. When he called me that day and said, Mom, the lady's coming up from the Innocent Project, I heard back, that was just so much joy. It felt good. It was my first sign of hope that, you know, possibly uh, things could be turning around. You know, I always seen darkness. Then I started seeing some light. I, I knew that we was getting closer to his freedom. So I was overwhelmed with just the fact that we was able to get back in the courtroom. And you were there when the judge read her decision? Yes, I was. How did that feel? <laughs> Ecstatic. It was one of the happiest days. You know, I, I was just thanking everyone that had something to do with him coming home and getting us to that point. Because I had that faith, you know, that the truth is what's going to set him free. And that's what set on free. It was her belief that I was coming home that, you know, really made me believe I was coming home. Even when, you know, during times when I felt like giving up at times. It was her, you know, positive, upbeat attitude and strength. And, you know, her telling me that I'm going to come home and things are going to be all right. You know, she would pick me up when I needed to be picked up and really convince me that I was coming home when I needed to be convinced. And when June came home, you got to welcome in into your new house and your new life. And how did that feel to have him be there to awesome. experience it? It was, it was totally awesome because I remember, like, I didn't sleep the night before because I was just so anxious and, and, and I just couldn't wait. It was just like when I was a kid waiting for Christmas time to come. You know, as you get mature, as you get older, I guess, you learn to appreciate things more. So with each passing day, I, I say that our relationship and uh, you know, our bond gets even stronger. How was you able to be so strong in a time when you know, it was such a hard time? And how were you just able to be so strong and not just for yourself, but you know, able to share that strength with me? You are my only son. And I think the idea of just thinking or knowing that it was a possibility that you weren't coming home, I couldn't fathom that. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp that. That was something that, no, they, they was not going to tell me this and I was going to believe that. So I kept telling myself I had to have faith because I knew you was innocent. You didn't give up on you. And you went in there and you just didn't sit on your hands, you did. Every time I turned around, you were saying, Mom, I'm following this, I'm following that. You helped free yourself. You didn't just sit back and say, okay, no, I'm going to accept what these people are saying. No, you didn't. You went in there and you fought for your freedom. And that makes me so proud. And to see you come home and the accomplishments you have made, you are very intelligent. I am so proud of you, and I love you to death.